All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. We have a lot to do today. You got to get this written down. It's big. We didn't, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about derivatives now. And we're going to take derivatives of harder things and it takes a long time. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Um, like a cubic. This is a cubic function. So what do you do when you have a cubic function? Well, we have to expand this cubic. What a pain that is. Do you remember doing this in grade 11? So it's, you're probably going to have to use uh, binomial theorem, Pascal's triangle, which works like this. Remember, you add the lines to get the next line, like you add the two above it to get the next number. And um, you, this, is, this is row three, because it goes zero, one, two, three. And so I use that when I got an exponent of three, and that gives me the coefficients. So then you can see that the coefficients are one, three, three, and one. And the exponents of one thing are descending, and the exponents of the other are ascending. And you got to expand that too, and you got to do all of that. And then, are you getting this down okay? And then you got to multiply through by the brackets, and then start collecting like terms. And then you notice that you're going to get an h that's so going to factor out. And the, well, actually, there's an easier way. Do you want to learn the easier way? We've been withholding a secret from you this whole time. There's actually an easier way. It gets really complicated when you have anything beyond degree two. Maybe we should do the easier way. OK, let's talk about derivatives of polynomials and see if we can simplify the process a little bit. That was like a whole page of writing. If you really want to write it down, you can, but it's a lot of writing. So we're talking about polynomials here. Now we're going to use that term a little bit loosely. And remember, the last day of the last unit, before we went to review, would have been last Friday, I guess. We talked about derivatives of polynomials. We talked about a couple of properties, things that happen when you take derivatives of polynomials. And we talked about what is a polynomial and what isn't. So today we're talking about polynomials, but we're actually going to break the rules of what a polynomial is. You'll see what I mean in a minute. But this is the definition of a polynomial and... Um, that thing that we were looking at, 2x cubed minus 4x squared plus x plus 1 is a perfect example. Beautiful polynomial, right? That's what we're talking about. Technically, polynomials have positive integer exponents, right? But we're going to... But the stuff we learned today will apply to other things as well. So some of what we look at today aren't officially polynomials, but the rules that we're going to look at will still work. A lot of what we're doing today is, ver is formal stuff. So this is a strange way of talking about things. If you've never seen this before as like the definition of a polynomial, a n, a n minus 1, then a 2, a 1, a naught, which would be a constant. Like if you've never seen that, we use that kind of notation when we're doing formal things. We're going to do some proofs today, and we're going to talk about formal properties. So that's why you know it's good to get used to this kind of notation. But, but then, after we do the formal version of it, it's probably going to make more sense when we look at an example. Okay, So for everything that we do, we'll look, we'll look at the formal property, the formal rule, but then we'll do an example. And a lot of what we do today is pretty easy. Like when you're actually doing it, it's pretty easy and straightforward. So um, hopefully you'll find that that's true. The first one we're going to look at is the constant function. It's a funny one because it's actually super easy and it's so straightforward. But for some reason, sometimes it messes people up. Um, if y equals c, c is some constant. We usually use c or k for a constant. Later when we do the proofs, we're going to use k. And in fact, today we're probably going to use k. But Then y prime equals, we've already seen this. Does anybody remember? Somebody said it? Zero. Good. Like, 
the fact that we look at this stuff formally is the hard part. You're never going to get that question wrong. You're going to do it a hundred times, a thousand times maybe, taking the derivative of a constant as part of the bigger process, and you're always going to know that it's zero. This is not something that you're not going to know. Um, we will flip back and forth today between the different kinds of notation. If you're given the equation with a y, then you're either going to use y prime or dy by dx. There is a time coming later in the unit where we use dy by dx notation. It's called Leibniz's notation, by the way. Um, Leibniz was a... So calculus was invented, it's very interesting, separately by two different people, but at the same time, like in different parts of the world, but they both developed it. And I think they probably were corresponding and they were probably working on similar problems, but they both invented calculus separately, different countries, but around the same time uh, of history. And one of them was Isaac Newton. Everybody knows Isaac Newton because he has a lot of famous uh, discoveries in science and particularly physics. Uh, but he did a lot of math too, obviously. We all know how related science and math are. But the other one was Leibniz. And Leibniz is not, has anybody ever heard of Leibniz? No. And it's amazing because people would say he may be the most brilliant person who's ever lived. He was probably one of the most, one of the most brilliant for sure. Brilliant mathematician and philosopher. Um, and his version of calculus is much more eloquent, the notation is much nicer, so what we do today looks more like what he developed, but you don't need to know any of that. But there's a thing that we do called the chain rule, again, it's coming later next week, and there's two ways of doing it, and one of them is, is Leibniz's way using this uh, notation. But we, what you really wanna just know is that, like, get used to using all the different kinds of notation. If you're given it as y, you can pick which one you use. It doesn't matter to me y prime or dy by dx for now. There will be a time where you have to use one or the other. If you're given it as like f at x, then you would say f prime, right? So you do the same thing. Uh, but we just need to know that they, y prime means the same thing as dy by dx. They are used in different circumstances for different things, sort of, but they mean the same thing. And it's just a notation thing. So this is y equals c. This is what we mean by a constant function. And sometimes, in fact, often probably, it's very useful to think of, to, to remind ourselves that the derivative of something is like the slope of the tangent. That's one way of thinking about it, okay? And that's often what we're using it for. And um, so if we look at a constant function, then its slope is going to be zero. So we know that. So we can do this. This is, this is not, that's not a proof, though. We will do a proof of that later, okay? The power rule. This is a big one. Again, formally stated, it might look kind of strange, but then once we see once we see it in action, and you know, by the time you come back in tomorrow, you're already going to be a pro at this one. And this is like, which is important, which is because it's big. So if my function f at x equals x to the n, then f prime is n times x to the n minus 1. And I'm just going to put this in words in case, but again, like you're never going to forget this. Like nobody could possibly get through calculus and not be, not like know this like the back of their hand. I mean, you're going to be like, this is a non-issue. This is not the thing that people struggle with, okay? Uh, but what it means is we bring the exponent down out front, becomes the coefficient, multiplied by the x part, and then decrease or reduce the exponent by one, or subtract one from the exponent. And remember when we talked at the end of the last unit how the derivative 
of a cubic degree 3, the derivative will be 2. So there you go. Subtract 1 from the exponent. If f at x equals x to the 4, then f prime is 4x to the 3. We have to do three or four of these things, state these rules or these properties before we can really start to use them to do what we want to do. That makes sense? I'm going to keep going. Everybody's okay? The constant multiple rule. Not to be confused with the constant rule. They're very different. Like I said, we're going to do proofs and you will be likely responsible for the proofs at some point. It'll pop up on a quiz or a test. We'll talk more about that later and tell you which ones you need to know, which ones you might be asked to do. Some of them you will, some of them you won't. In other words, uh, okay, so if f at x equals k times g at x. Again, this is going to look strange at first, but we're going to do a few examples and then I would encourage you to look back because you will have you will be responsible for the proofs and just in general getting more and more used to the formal way of state this notation, the formal way of stating these things. Um, it would be a good idea after you get familiar with how to do all of this, you kind of look back. Um, but anyway, then f prime is equal to k times g prime. This is, but you're going to do this so much, you, you, you just know it. Like you, you're never going to have to, what was the constant multiple rule again? Hmm. The proof you're going to have to memorize and get familiar with, but this part's easy. Okay, so for example, negative 7x cubed, that's a very familiar looking term. In other words, this is negative 7 times x cubed, right? So x cubed is our function g at x that we're thinking of. It's a weird, but you would just think of, isn't negative 7x cubed the function? Well, yes. But we can take uh, even something this simple and break it up and think of it as separate parts. And that's often how these proofs work. Okay, then y prime is that constant negative 7 times the derivative of x cubed, which we now know how to do. It's 3x squared. But you would never do this in two steps, and you would never write it like that. How would you do it? Negative 7 times 3 is negative 21x squared. So we're getting close to where we need to be to be able to really start taking derivatives of polynomial functions. Any questions about that? Again, you would always do that in one step but this is just showing the form, the formality of it and all that. Got it, got it, got it. All right. This one's interesting. I'll let you take a second to get it copied down. There are some things in math that are intuitive. There are some things in math that people think are intuitive, but they're wrong. And unfortunately, people continue to make the, that mistake over and over and over again. One of them comes up in MHF, and it looks like this, sine 2 theta. What do people think that is? What's the mistake that people think it is? Huh? Yeah. Uh, well, it, this is 2 theta, but it's 2 times sine theta, right? And that's not true. Hopefully, we remember that that's not true. But that's what people think. And even though we talk about it and we learn the formula for sine of 2 theta, people still make that mistake. Um, another one that people make, starting back in grade 10, and then continue to make in grade 11 and grade 12. And it even, like, uh, like the test that you wrote yesterday, there's sort of moments where people made this mistake. They think it's equal to this. It's a, it was more, a bit more complex on our test. But people think it's that. 
Oh my gosh. It just kills us to see that, right? Especially in grade 11 and 12. But anyway, sometimes you're just, it's just a silly mistake because you're rushing and you're thinking about something else. But those are things that, that seem intuitive, but our intuition is wrong. They are not true. And we've seen why. So be careful of that. So we're going to explore something that would be our intuition. G at x is 4, x squared. So g prime is going to be 2 times 4 is 8, x to the 1, right? So 8x. 2x cubed, 3 times 2 is 6, x squared. Okay with this? We're kind of setting some stuff up so we can use it to explore some new properties. So if f at x is g plus h, then what is f at x? It's just this. g was 4x squared, and h was 2x cubed. So that's f at x. And then the next question says, what is g prime plus h prime? Well, g prime is, is 8x, and h prime is 6x squared. So what's the thing that we might, that, what's the point of this? What's the thing we might observe? We might be using our intuition to suspect is that f prime. So if f is the sum of two other functions, is the derivative of f the sum of the derivatives of those two functions? And yes, it is. It turns out this is true. And it looks like it should be true. And our intuition would tell us that it's true. And this one turns out that it is true. This is not a proof. We will prove this. Oops. But it is true. Uh, so if f at x equals g at x plus h at x, then f prime equals g prime plus h prime. There's an asterisk that we always will include when we do these formally. This is kind of a given, I think. It will always kind of be true for us, but when you're, if you're ever reading a textbook or a book about this stuff and they're doing a formal process, you'll notice they always include all these little details. Given that G and H are differentiable. Remember, some functions can't be differentiated, like some things are and some things aren't. And they really always will be for us. There's not a case where things won't be differentiable, but like I said, formal process. For example, again, remember what I said, like some people might be like, okay, well, I'm like, I'm sort of following, but I don't really understand how to put this into action, and that's where the examples really show us what's going on. So this is going to be 2 times 5, so 10x to the 1, plus this has an exponent of 1, so 1 times 8 is 8, 8x to the 0. And what is the derivative of a constant? 0. And you wouldn't really write it like this, but again, just for our note, x to the 0 is 1. Anything to the 0 is 1, so that's just 10x plus 8. And this is what I mean. You're going to take the derivative of a constant so often because it's always at the end of a polynomial, and it's always 0, and we just know that it's 0. Everybody okay with this? 
Okay, and the, finally, the last sort of property or rule that we're going to look at, what if f at x is the difference of two functions, which this is really a restatement of the last one because um, subtracting something is just the same as adding the negative version of that, right? So if it's true for adding, it's going to be true for subtracting, essentially. Uh, but if, if you think of it as, as adding a negative. Um, but we're still going to do them as separate rules and separate proofs. So we cover all our bases. Very, very formal thing. Uh, g at x was 4x squared, and h at x was 2x cubed, and then g prime is 8x minus h prime, which was 6x squared. So again, is that f prime? <coughs> And yes, it is. Given that uh, G and H are differentiable. So this is, again, a typical polynomial. Some of them were adding, some of them were subtracting, some of the terms are positive, some of them are negative. This is the kind of thing we want to be able to take the derivative of. We could have done this with the definition of a derivative in the last unit. 3 times 2 is 6x squared minus 8x plus 1. The derivative of x will just be 1, right? because it's got an exponent of 1 and a coefficient of 1. 1 times 1 is 1. x to the 0, so 1. Recognize that? That's the thing that I made the joke about. So if you really want, you can do it this way. Go for it. A whole page of work to do a cubic function, a degree 3 function, and a lot of opportunities to make mistakes in expanding all of that. Or you could... Do it like that. It's a little bit better. And, you know, I've had students who have taken calculus already and then they're retaking functions and they want they say, can I just, can I skip the x minus a part and just cut to the chase and do it the easy way? Of course not. Why do we do it the hard way when there's this other way that's so easy? Well, we always want to see where these things come from. As I said, the H formula we're going to use for the proofs, and we're going to prove all of these. It's good to know the formality of these things. It's good to see the history of them. It's good to understand where they come from. We're going to do so many derivatives that we will forget that it all came from the slope formula from grade 9. But that's why in MHF we do it that way, and we start off. Plus, uh, when we did limits, we weren't just taking derivatives. We were also... Uh, evaluating limits. And you evaluate limits in other areas of mathematics other than just derivatives, although it's famously used in derivatives. Go ahead and do the first one. I think you've got this one. Everybody get 10x minus 6? So some of the stuff that, well, often you will be taking derivatives of things that are this. I mean, they're going to get a little bit more complicated in some ways. But parts of it will be this simple. Okay. So again, you're going to do this so many times. This is, this is not something you could... By tomorrow, you're going to be perfect at this, and you'll never forget it. This is the kind of thing where you could ask somebody you know, who hasn't taken a math class in 50 years, 
what's the derivative of x squared and they would be able to figure that out if they took calculus in high school. Everybody remembers this, right? Um, but it does get more complex. So, so on Monday, not tomorrow, but the next class, we're going to start looking at taking derivatives of more complex things. But a big part of this unit and a big part of where students start to struggle in this course is that different expressions will be easier with different techniques. There's no rule. There's no, in this situation, do this. In this situation, do that. You have to become the expert and know when to, what technique is going to be the easiest. This probably doesn't make a lot of sense now, but I'll remind you later down the road. Um, so after we start to do some harder things, we got to come back and remember Sometimes there's an easier way. Like when you're dividing by a function. So this is 2, which is a constant, divided by x cubed. So there's a rule of how to take a derivative when you're dividing functions. It's called the quotient rule. We'll do that on Tuesday next week, I think. Okay, but... You would never use it to solve something. First of all, we don't know it, so we can't. But you would never use a quotient rule to solve something like this. You would rewrite it as 2x to the negative 3. So this isn't technically a polynomial because it's got a negative exponent. But all the stuff we've done today can be used to take the derivative of this. So 5 is a constant. It's gone. Negative 3 times 7 is negative 21. x to the 6. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. And subtracting 1 from the exponent, it becomes negative 4. You could, of course, rewrite this like this. I don't know that you ever would. Maybe some once in a while you will. Um, there's no rule that you have to, but in some cases it might be helpful. I don't know. Make sense? Okay. Um, so again, always remember, like sometimes simplifying a little bit first before you take the derivative will make your life way easier than just trying to take the derivative. Here's another example. A couple of things about this one. For one, we changed up the variables for the first time. Instead of y and x, we've got s and t. These are common variables used in physics class and science for uh, distance or position and time, in this case, right? And so you know, once in a while, you might have some kind of restriction, like t is greater than 0. Time, we don't usually think about negative time. Um, so that's one thing about this question that's a little bit different. But the other thing is, now this is a product of two functions, isn't it? It's 4t times t squared minus 3t. It's the product of two polynomials. And on Monday, we're going to learn the product rule, how to take the derivative of the product of two functions. It gets quite a bit more complex. This is what I'm saying. But in this case, can't we just do this? There's no reason why I'm using this notation, as I said before, or just flipping back and forth. This becomes 12t squared minus 24t. Right? So, again, try not to forget. If a question says use the product rule to differentiate because you're supposed to be practicing the product rule, that's one thing. If on a test or a quiz it says use the product rule, that's one thing. And there are absolutely cases where using the product rule is the easier way of doing things. But not in this case. In this case, it's easier to simplify and then just take the derivative of each part of the polynomial separately. This is another example of that. Another quotient, a polynomial on top and a polynomial on the bottom. If you knew the quotient rule, you could use it. But maybe you would choose to do it this way.
So this becomes 5 over 4, x to the negative 1, 2 minus 3 using exponent laws, minus 3 over 4, x to the 5, and then g prime, x to the negative 2, minus 15 over 4, x to the 4. Again, it just, sometimes it'll be a matter of preference, sometimes... Some people will forget that there's easier ways of doing things, and, and this is where you want to get really good, really proficient at all the different techniques and all the different kinds, and just practice, 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 so you know when to use which technique. Any questions about any of this? I've got a few more examples we're going to go through. I don't really know the point of this example. Sometimes in textbooks or whatever or on worksheets, the question is looks like it's designed for the when you take the derivative for things to kind of cancel. So when I do three times a third, it's one. Right, so this just ends up being x squared, and 2 times a half is 1, so plus x. What would the derivative of pi be? 0, good, because it's a constant, right? It's just a number. It's a special number, but it's still just a number. So derivative of any number, any constant is 0. What is an exponent of one-third? What does that mean? It's a cube root, right? So if you were given a question in radical form, you might say, ah, oh, we didn't learn how to do that. Yes, well, yeah, because it's, that's just another way of writing an exponent. So we do know how to take the derivative of, of a radical, of the cube root of x. This is something we could do. So this example is important because it tells us that there's no reason why, again, this is not technically a polynomial, but the same rules apply. There's no reason why you can't apply these same rules to fractions. So dy by dx, 6 times a third is 2, and 1 third minus 1 is negative 2 thirds. Negative 5 times 2 thirds is negative 10 over 3. 2 thirds minus 1 is negative 1 third. And this is where I think we start to see a little bit of why calculus is a difficult course and why you know people find it harder than advanced functions is because like there's just there's so any in any every simple little question there's so many little things you have to be good at and be aware of you can get through grade 10 math without being very good, right but by the time you get here there's exponent laws, fractions, multiplying, adding, subtracting fractions, like all these different places that you can make mistakes. And people do make little mistakes. And the little mistakes get blown up into bigger mistakes when you're using derivatives to do other things. So it starts to get a lot trickier, right? And the algebra just gets very complex, very thick. So this is a good thing that you want to be proficient at, good at... Um, because it's what we do for quite a while. So this is exactly what I was talking about. If it's in radical form, what's the first thing we're probably going to do is write it in exponent form. So the square root of x, x to the 1 half. Square root of x cubed, x to the 3 halves. 
And 4 over the square root of x is going to be 4x to the negative 1 half. And now we can take the derivative. Any questions? One more example to do. Again, it's just a matter of notation, this last one. This is not something we would, it's not a question you'd get very often. The only reason is to be familiar with function notation, the notation. It is something we'll see in the proofs. But typically, when you're taking derivatives, it won't have a g at x in it kind of thing, unless the function is g at x. So how would I take the derivative of negative 4 g at x? It's negative 4 g prime. right? That's how we would write that. That's all. So that's really just a matter of notation.